I'm Rolando. This is Tony Marshall. Mr. Marshall, we're going to ask you questions about your serving in the military. Um, okay, wow. I'll make this easy for you. You can ask any question you want. I may not answer it, but feel free to ask anything you want. So, I've served in the U.S. Air Force, served in Vietnam, and let's go with your questions. You were talking about a farm before you, like, go in the military. Why did you say for people to do well, that? Well, I grew up on a farm, and it was such a rich experience that I would recommend it for everybody, not just prior to going in the military, but as a part of growing up. One, you get to know nature. You get to know work schedules. You get up before the sun rises. You work all day. When the sun goes down, it's time to quit work. You get to do manual labor. Okay? You get a respect for life, animals. You see animals live and die. You get to see plants be born, so germinate, die. Okay? You get to harvest crops. You get to grow fresh food. Okay? The beauty of it when I was growing up was as a child, you got to explore. You weren't restricted, you weren't afraid of anything. You'd go wandering in the woods all day long. Nobody cared where you were. You were safe. So you learn to respect things like snakes. You learn that you can pick blackberries, but there are thorns. Okay, so the other thing you learn is that chickens and pigs are food, they're not pets. So. I think I got a great appreciation for nature there, a lot of independence, and a lot of insight into how the world really works. So it's just really preparation? I think it's preparation for life in general. What can you describe the talk with your mother when, <laughs> when you told her? Okay, that's, I think one of my better memories is when I had decided to go to combat I wanted to sit my mother down and explain to her what was about to happen. And as always, she took the attitude that I'm the mother and I don't want to talk about it. But I kept insisting we had to talk. She kept insisting, insisting she did not want to talk about it. The only thing that we could agree on was I, would, I had to explain to her that at that time there were idiots in this country who would read in the newspaper that you were overseas and someday when they were bored they would pick up the phone, call the home and tell the parent, hey your kid just got killed today. So my instruction to her was if someone did that not to pay attention to them unless she had not heard from me for a week because we wrote every day practically. So, But other than that she did not want to discuss the combat aspect. We need to talk. We need to talk about my combat assignment in Vietnam. No. Yes, Mom. I don't want to. Okay, look. I respect your wishes. But I need you to know that there are some idiots in this country who are going to read the newspapers and it's going to say that I'm going off to war. And they may call you and say that I'm dead. But don't believe them. No matter what, don't believe them. All right, just wait a week. And if you hear nothing from me in that time, then listen to them. No matter what, make me proud. Uh, were there any other ways that she supported you in flying? Many other ways. In fact, my interest in the Air Force Academy came from a magazine article that she found. And the title of this article was, You Are Nobody Here, which really intrigued me. But it talked about how tough the Air Force Academy was. Beyond that, to get the nomination, obviously, if you know how to get into one of the military academies, you have to get a nomination from someone in Congress or the president. I'd again, again, I knew none of those folks. We didn't. But I wrote to my senator, both of them, my congressman, and we had a congressman at large. 
I got no response from one senator. The other senator said that my scores were so low he couldn't possibly appoint me, yet I was number one in my school. The representative said that he had filled his slot, which was very politically correct. Congressman at large invited me to an interview, one of 250 kids, and somehow I got the nomination. And I patted myself on the back for years, thinking I had done great to get the nomination. And when my mom passed away, my sister said, if you really want to know how you got that nomination, you should listen. As it turns out, the congressman at large came to dinner one night at a home where my mother was serving dinner. She obviously put a bug in his ear and asked her to give his or give her kid a nomination. So some networking that went on behind the scenes. She never told me that she did that. She let me think I did it on my own. When I graduated from the academy, everybody she knew, everybody she worked for was so excited that she was going to see her kid graduate. And she told everybody, I'm going, I'm going. A week before, she said, I'm not going. And she told me, I'm not coming, I'm sending your sister. It's too far to go on a train and I'm not getting on an airplane. So that was my mother. Very proud of me graduating from the academy, but she was not gonna make that trip. Too far. Too far, but I totally understood. And that was her way of doing things. So, as I said, she said, don't worry about things you can't control. That was her. Very much an enigma, but very profound, very smart, having only finished the sixth grade. She only finished the sixth grade? Sixth grade, that was it. But book knowledge, probably not the greatest, but in common sense, absolute wizard. She's more worried about you? Mother, I would say, did not worry very much. Um, she was what you would call an enigma. The whole time I was growing up, she knew I wanted to fly, and she had two sayings. One, if God had meant for you to fly, he'd have given you wings. She said he would have gave you wings. And number two, if you knew what I know, you'd stay your butt on the ground. And at the same time, she would take me to the airport and let me watch airplanes, and she would buy models for me. So she was aware of the dangers of combat. She knew that I was going to go, and she accepted it. One of the other things she taught me early on, there are things in this universe you have no control over. Your role in life is to filter out what you can control and ignore the rest because you're wasting your time worrying about things you cannot control. In this case, she knew I wanted to fly. She wanted me and my sister to do greater things than she did. She was absolutely fearful of flying and swimming, but she did not hold us back from that. So that was her way of saying, I know you're going, I don't agree with it, but I accept it. After graduation, did you feel like you were ready for combat? After graduation and after going through the training and flying with the folks I had flown with, I was more than ready. Uh, nothing to it. And that's all the questions on my side. Can you describe the day you were shut down? Of course. It was a beautiful day in July, and our mission was to go out and mark targets for bombers. And I had never flown with this individual, but he had a reputation for doing foolish things repeatedly. And your basic rules were you don't do foolish things. You never make yourself predictable by being repetitive. And there was a 4,500 foot altitude that you didn't go below unless absolutely necessary. The reason being, for those folks that like to shoot in the air on New Year's and to celebrate other things, most small caliber weapons, the ammunition goes up to 4,500 feet, stops and falls. If you're above there, you're not going to get hit by something small. If you happen to be right at 4,500 feet and the bullet stops there and you hit it at 600, it's the same difference as if it hit you at full velocity. The majority of the folks that got shot down in Vietnam, it was because of small arms going below 4,500 feet. 
this individual liked to do that. We had a chat before we got in the plane. He promised not to do it on this mission. And then he went ahead and did it anyway. As near as we can tell, because my ego says we didn't get shot down, but as near as we can tell from eyewitnesses, there's a fuel tank on the belly of the airplane. The nose cone came off, causing the airplane to go out of control, and we were too low to recover it. So the sequence of events is we roll in. He fires a rocket to mark the target for the bombers that are orbiting. And he's still talking about the smoke that's already on the ground, and we're still proceeding down, according to the witnesses. Not sure why he was still going down, but maybe to shoot something with his gun. But at some point, the airplane departed control. He absolutely lost control of it. And the word I've gotten is that if that happens, the airplane pitches as much as it can and then tucks as much as it can. It does that a couple of times you're a passenger. As soon as it pitched the first time, he realized we were too low and he had to pull the handles. So he pulled the ejection handles. The sequence of events is I'm in the back seat. I have to go first. Otherwise, when his rocket ignites, it's going to burn me. So when he pulls the handles, my canopy goes, my seat goes, his canopy goes, and he follows me. And that's all like that. It's magic. But I, one of my hobbies I told you was photography. So I carried my camera with me in combat and I was taking pictures and I knew when the bombers started their bombing there was gonna be great fireworks. So I wanted a fresh roll of film in the camera and I was putting a nice new roll of film in my camera when I heard something go boom. And the old brain says, it's unusual. You just heard something explode, but you didn't feel anything. And that's all that happened, because after that, everything went white. And the reason everything went white is the seat had fired up the rail, and I didn't have my visor down, so 600 miles an hour wind in the eyeballs. So, And, of course, I'd removed my helmet at that point. But the seat's magic. It kicks you out of the airplane, and... I have to tell you, I was asleep at that time. I went into total shock. I don't remember anything after the boom and it turning white. So Mother Nature puts you to sleep to protect you. But the seat fires you out, the rocket pushes you clear of the airplane, and then the parachute comes out automatically, deploys your seat kit and life raft, and you float down. And the next thing I remember is I'm standing on the ground, and I've got a banana tree behind me on this side. I'm on a hillside, and there's a little brush, scrub brush on this side, and my parachute's hanging over this. And then all of a sudden, I'm doing the out of body thing where I'm standing over here looking at this idiot standing there with a radio in his hand, who's me. And then the airplanes are going by, making a lot of noise. And I found out later that they said I was just babbling away on the radio. They could not make sense out of what I was saying. So they finally just said, would you please shut up and we'll ask you questions like you're doing and give us one click for yes and two clicks for no. And the questions were, are you okay? Yes, okay. And then sometime in the near future, it dawns on me that there are six or seven people in front of me carrying AK-47s in green uniforms, which is when I realized that things are not going very well and they're gesturing at me with their rifles and I'm putting my hands up but they're nervous because they have no idea what I'm doing plus I'm wearing a 38 pistol 
and I'm just standing there like an idiot, so they really don't know what I'm going to do. Somehow I convince them that the 38's loaded, I drop it. They're still nervous. They want me to take off the survival vest, take that off, drop it. They're still nervous. So now they want me to take off the flight suit, which I take off, and they relax. They take the flight suit and they end up playing with the zippers and the Velcro tape. And then they march me off to a little prison cell. Can you describe the Ugh and razor blade scene? Ugh was one of our guards. We had two guards. Filao was our prima donna. His dad was foreign service. He spoke almost perfect English. Did not like to get his hands dirty. Ugh was a tank driver, armor. You could tell by his insignia. And Ugg was the one I liked to play with, you know, with the newspaper and the shinning up the tree and everything. So he enjoyed it, I enjoyed it. That was our routine. But one day, we had to shave once a week. We got one razor and one blade. Everybody used it. Ugg made the mistake of bringing two blades one day. So, of course, you know what I'm going to do with the extra blade. I stole it. Ugg didn't miss it until he got back to the office. So we're back in the cell, Ugg comes back, holds up the empty razor and gestures, and of course he looks at me because I'm the troublemaker. I go around, pick up everything in the room except the blade. He gets frustrated and goes away. Somebody teaches him how to say blade. So he comes back, says blade. So I point to the wash area where it should be. He opens the door, he and I go out to look for it. And I'm looking, he's looking. I know it's not there because it's hidden in the room, but I've only told one of my cellmates where it is. So my cellmate wanders out, he's got it in his hand, and it's in a bright yellow and red wrapper. So I said, just drop it. He drops it right in the middle of the wash area. And we wait for Ugg to find it. Ugg walks over it at least a dozen times, never finds it. So we go back to the cell. And about 10 minutes later, Philao comes, points to me and says, you put on the long clothes, the officer wants to talk to you. So we had short pajamas and long pajamas. Whenever you had to talk to one of the big wigs, you had to put on the long pajamas. Put on my long pajamas, and I tell the guys, here's what's gonna happen. As soon as I leave, they're gonna come in and tell you that I confessed. And you might as well confess too. Said, forget it, I'm not gonna tell them anything, so don't let them pull that on you. I go over and sit down with the big cheese. They go in and they rip up the cell, they rip it apart and they find everything else we've stolen except the razor blade. So I sit down with the guy and we called him Plato because his mantra was, I know the American people better than you. So, okay, we'll play along. Hi, Mayor. Ah, uh, Mr. Marshall. I know you. I know the American people better than you. And now, as we drink, the guards will search your cell for the missing razor blade. Mr. Marshall, you are not like the other prisoner. When I talk to most of them, they look at the floor, but you just look right through me. Yes, you know me. What do you think of Dr. King? He was a great man. He was nonviolent. He was a violent man! Explain.
before Dr. King visited Selma, whenever the KKK appeared, black people ran and hid under their bed. But after Dr. King's visit, they stood on the port and thumbed their noses at the Klan that they were ready to fight. I guess I was wrong. What do you think of Julian Bond? He was a young man. No, an old man. Explain. Among the distinguished graduate of Morehouse College at Benjamin Benneker, George Washington Carver, and Julian Bond. See, they are all old men. Guess I was wrong again. I need you to sign this anti-war statement. No. Why not? All your brothers signed it. How do you know these are brothers? They're all black names. George Washington Robinson? Jesse Smith? Okay, I give up. You've got me again. Just can't get anything right today, huh? Zero for three. I can't wait until I get home and tell Willie Nelson and Willie Schumacher that they're black and didn't know it. Okay. Go ahead. Pleasure to meet you, sir. Great glad to meet Good. you, sir. My name is Tony Marshall. I'm currently 69 years old. Oh, my name is Min Bui. Age 74. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> Little history. Um, I joined the Air Force when I was 21 and went through navigator training. And actually, during my training, I got to deliver an airplane to Da Nang. Mm -hmm. So that was my first chance to get over there, just to deliver an aircraft to see what was going on. Mm -hmm. After that, I went back, finished training. And I was 24 when I came over. And I was based in Thailand and flew for a year and a half, my normal tour. Stuck around for a while, foolishly. And I was 25 on my last mission, and 26 when I was released. So that's my story over there. Oh, good. Um, I joined the uh, force, talk about Vietnamese force, since I just 19 years, 18 and a half, 19 years old. And after training, about six, seven months, they sent me to United States to be Air Force Technical uh, at Amarillo Air Force Base. Texas for six months, and then went to Craig Air Force Base at Selma, Alabama. After that, before we went home, they sent me about three months to, for Lakeland, English, mm -hmm. to some more, and get back to Vietnam at uh, 1963. From that time, I stayed on Air Force, Vietnamese Air Force. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I got there in 1971 and of course released in 73. Mm -hmm. But uh, for me, it was quite an interesting tour. So I enjoyed it. Flew about 266 missions. Japan and Thailand, yes, I know the place to myself, yes. yep. And uh, back to Vietnam, that time we don't have any jet aircraft yet. Right. So I just walk on turbo, like 86, C-10, something like that. Mm -hmm. But a uh, little change, when I flew back from um, United States to Vietnam, I met one gentleman in the, my plane. He was major, and we talked about, because he, he liked to, to talk with me, because I, on that time, am the good English than my people. Right. And he gave me his address where he lived in, in Saigon. And he asked me, if you get a chance to come over, we go mm -hmm. out, you show me some of your country. I'm glad to hear that. So after back home about three or four months, I had a chance to stop to see him. So I took him out with my, my motorcycle bit, yeah. around. And little things remind me. He said, hey, boy, do we have to put a helmet? I said, Vietnam, we don't use a helmet to go around. <laughs> That's all the kind of things. It's everything so far so good. And I think it's started in 1965, 68, something like that. The war started. Mm -hmm. 
So my colonel in the Vietnamese Air Force come to me and my group around and say, hey, the war start now. We need some guy, have fun, and proud. I thought, wow, we are proud around here. And then he mentioned about special forces. Mm -hmm. And then mentioned about the American advisor, some big rank on the on American side, need some people like myself speaking English and to be side by side with them. On that, on that time, my age, as you know, young, <laughs> to yes. be proud to do something for your country. Mm -hmm. Especially me, just come back to the United States. So I, I, I think that I'm a movie star, something like that, you know. <laughs> so yeah, I'm signing. Yes. And um, the one ca captain of Special uh, come to me and talk some, and then I remember the gentleman I met in the in aircraft on airplane when he went home. So I pulled my, his business card and show, oh, I know this guy. So they called, talked together, whatever. Uh, about half hour, my friend, the major on the airplane with me, show up. We hope together, hey, you work for me from now, boy, something like that. I told, yeah, why not? Because wear uniform, go around town, Friends. nothing. I don't think about we want to fight. <laughs> Bang. After a week and two, have a good time together, go out, eat, and, and he show up with the uniform, like a, what do you call it, camouflage uniform, that's what I try to remember my age. I said, what on, she fit you or not? I said, yeah. And he gave me the green beret. I said, whoa, what the heck is that? You know, <laughs> so I put on. Here the gun, here the thing, thing. So, whop, whop, whop. so we went out. He tried the jeep, and the two guys behind me and me go to inside uh, Tension Airlines. We got a helicopter. He flew about half hour, land down someplace I never been before. Looked like at the camp, and underground people, cover, bankers, so everything. So, especially some sandbag over my head too. Here come one lieutenant, American lieutenant, and some guy, and radio man come shake my hand. Here's your new guy. I said, what? It's okay. So we take together in the, what you call, a mess hall, some of that, have a lunch, talk, have a couple of beer, and he showed me the place I can stay. And my friend shake my hand, hey, see you again next <laughs> couple of months, couple of weeks, whatever, if you get a chance. I tell what the heck is that? And about now and two, the camp, uh, the leader came, I think the captain at that time, and the SF force, uh, special force, I mean, take me out to camp and tell her, hey, show me how you can shoot. I do. yeah, her training, I shoot some, but now to tell me how to shoot. So he gave me the, uh, not the M16, I look like an M15, the short one. Okay. With short barrel and a couple of round. Hey, you're good. <laughs> oh, what the heck is good for? It's okay, fine. So we went there and showed me all around and what I had to do. Fine, nothing. And believe it or not, I found out and the came to get about 30 or 20 Vietnamese guys. So we talked some, and um, the uh, leader came to that boy. From now on, it's not allow you to go around with all Vietnamese people because you are my, our side. Okay. So we uh, he called me to go outside myself. We talked together. We don't know exactly those people around you. Maybe VC. So I said, oh wow, what the heck mm -hmm. is that for? So fine. In about a week after go out, train shoot and crawl and something like that, like a first time in the service. Fine. And one day about four or five o'clock morning, 
somebody knocked my room and said, hey, ready to go. I don't know what to go in, you know. He said, hey, operation. So I got out in front of the people that have a four guy with gun, everything ready, and one radio man, myself, and one lieutenant. We go. I look at the lieutenant and I introduce myself, blah, 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 and they say, okay, let's go. Boom. And one little thing that amazed me, I forgot. It's hard to pronounce my name, boy, a boy, a boy, a boy. So the lieutenant said, hey, from now on, I, I named you Mr. Flash. <laughs> How about that? I said, yeah, Flash or, or Thunder, whatever. It's okay. okay to me. But are you sure that we go for have fun, a peace, or what? I said, hey, who knows? Well, yeah. Hey, hey, hey. So we go. One thing remind me, I'm the guy, CD had guy, was born CD. Mm-hmm. And they would be in jungle with all the boats and everything, playing around, mosquito and so on, yet. And where are we going? Believe it or not, I cannot say no, I return it. <laughs> no. So we went, and uh, another thing is, keep my mind so much. Look like one big tree fall off. Yeah, I don't know. On my way, the guy jump, jump. I cannot jump with about 40, 30 pounds, my bike and gun and C ratio, all my. Because uh, people don't look at me, are you crazy? You care all that? He say, hey, if I'm hungry, what do I do? <laughs> and those guys care so much, I care everything I can. <laughs> Believe it. And then I, I try to go around the tree, I fell, pin, half my way body. In the trunk, too big, and I half away. People look at me laughing, pull me out. My back, back fall around, I tell, shh, mm-hmm. my first time. Anyway, it's okay. Hey, be sure to do whatever they've been told to do. First mission, three, three days, four nights. Everything smooth, we get home, oh, relaxing. Take a shower, everything. But one thing to make sure people, young kids understand, the camp is for to protect and fighting. It's not in city, it's not in town. You go out of the camp, that means you, you lost, you don't know where you're going. Around you is jungle and light mine. You step, blow you up. So only us who know where we get out, where we get back. And all the underground and sand back around you. And sometimes you look at you lost some another world. It's not back to city, not the way you grow up. And most of the time, my first week, my first month. I cannot sleep at night. Not scary, but strange to me. The weather, different city, the rain, sun, and then some sound of the animal outside, the jungle. So I feel lost. And sometimes I think that, geez, what we call special forces? <laughs> well, that's a way. I was trained and I accept my duty. Yeah. After a couple of times, operation, everything's okay. And one thing is I make sure that people understand me. We are special forces. That's been very special. We don't go by 10, 20 people. Uh, you need something like that, which are for a few people only. Mm-hmm. And what happened to me one time, looked like a very hot inside my camp. People know it. I always stay with American advisor. My room close to them, close to the radio room, everything. I, my, my order is not talk to people around Vietnamese. Mm-hmm. 